Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel. And I'm Kate Humble and we're here with two of Longleat's five white rhino and they are just magnificent. It's great to see them this close up, isn't it? They are tucking into their breakfast there and I happen to know that they love a little tiggle behind the ears, <laughs> which never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> well, we have plenty of stories today from the house, the estate and, of course, the safari park. This is what's coming up on today's programme. A male lion has been brought in to start a new pride, but will his two intended brides fall for his charms or go for his throat? They could work as a team and give him a bit of a pasting. I'll be feeding the meerkats their favourite snack. It's something nice and juicy. They're very much alive and wiggling, aren't they? And in the cellars beneath Longleat House, there's a tale of ghosts and gruesome murder. In fact, this is where he was actually dug up. First, we're going up to Lion Country, where it's the end of an era for Mafui's pride. The group recently lost young male Kamali, along with Sazi and her two new cubs, who've moved to a wildlife park in Yorkshire. That leaves 10-year-old Mafui with five lionesses. But three of them are now too old to breed, while the other two are his daughters. So the time has come to bring in fresh genes. Later today, keeper Bob Trollope will have a new lion to look after. The main reason why we're bringing a new male in is to bring a new bloodline in. You cannot just breed and breed and breed from the lions that you have. Obviously, nature takes over and you would start inbreeding, which we don't want. You get such a problem with inbred animals, you get weaknesses in the genetics. With some animals, you get brittle bones, and it's just a, such a big problem. To keep the name of the Lions of Longleat going, we obviously have to bring new bloodlines in. The idea is to start another pride with the new boy and Mafui's two daughters. These are two sisters that are about two and a half to three years old now. In our view, this is the right time to bring a new male in because they're at that age where they're maturing, they'll be coming into their season very soon, and hopefully a new male on the scene will prompt them into coming into the season. And now the new boy has just arrived. His name is Kabir, and he's come from Port Lim Wildlife Park in Kent. He must be kept away from Mafui at all costs, because the two males would fight to the death. So Mafui and his three older lionesses are being kept out in the paddock, while his daughters have been installed in the lion house. <laughs> The first thing we've had to do is separate the two females from the rest of the pride and get them in beforehand. If you put the male in first, they would get as far as that door, see something that was totally alien to them and not come in. <laughs> you know, the racket that they make might put him off coming out of the box. But Kabir was sedated for the journey here, and he's still woozy. So Bob's going to leave him in the trailer overnight to sleep it off. We'll be back later when it's time to bring him in to the lion's den. Last year, after a whirlwind romance, Trevor and Honey the ostriches settled down to start a family. Their first child, little Al, is growing fast. But now, Mum and Dad have been at it again. They've been working on a new brother or sister for Junior. And, of course, the keepers want to do all they can to help. I'm up in the East Africa Reserve with keepers Andy Hayton and Ryan Hockley. And as you can see, we've sort of made an artificial barrier here with our cars to keep the ostrich, that's Trevor, away from us because we're making an unusual construction. Is that right? Yeah, the ostrich have been laying eggs, yeah. so we're just going to make a scrape for them. And what's a scrape? A, a nest, basically? A nest, basically, yeah. What they'd do out in the wild is they'd make just a, a shallow depression okay. in the sand and the eggs would be put in there, so we're, uh, we're doing it for them. Okay, so lots of hard graft. Now, obviously, we're, we're surrounded in <laughs> giraffes, ostrich, I know there's llama in here. They're all quite interested in anything new that's going on out here, so as soon as uh, Honey and Trev start sitting between them, okay. um, it'll... Uh, the eggs will be well protected. How often do you do this? Once a year, really, Ben. It's only a, a once yearly thing with the egg laying and mating. So yeah. 
Um, this is just a new one for this season, and it will serve its purpose for 40 days or so. Have you guys sort of learnt from trial and error what sort of size to go for, what sort of sand to use? Yeah, last year we had a problem. We used sand that was actually too fine. They really pounded the sand down, and we had some heavy rain, uh -huh. and the nets actually got half flooded. So okay. the eggs were actually sat half in water. So what will happen? I mean, how many eggs will, um, in theory, be laid on here? Well, we've got half a dozen to put out here now. Right. So last year. Do you collect? Where have they come from? Um, we, she kind of lays them indiscriminately everywhere. Right. Um, so what we've done is we collect them up. Yeah. And we get a fairly good number of them together, and then we'll put them out here like this, and then she'll start sitting and then continue to lay where the eggs are left for her. And how long does she sit on them for? 40 days. Right. Uh, but they take it in turns. Um, Honey does the day. Yeah. And uh, Trev does the night shift. Wow, that's, that's equal opportunities, isn't it? Yeah, it's for, kind, of a, um, both of them. kind of an instinctive thing because the danger from predators is more so at night right. in the wild. So where are the eggs, Andy? The eggs are actually in the back of the truck there. Shall I, gonna, shall I get them out? Grab them out, yeah. Ryan, you're keeping a close eye on, um, on Trevor. He's quite interested in what we're doing, but his main concern, really, I think, is keeping an eye on honey there. Wow! That is just... I can't get over the weight of it. Heavy, about two and a half pounds. About the weight of a bag of sugar. That is just incredible. Now, you've written numbers on this. Is that so you that's can the, monitor that's them? That's the dates of, of when those particular eggs were laid. Right. So... And you, can, and you can basically now monitor for how long they've been sitting on them and when they should um, that's eventually... Right. It's just any bit of uh, information we can gather on things that we do like this okay. um, is good for us in the future. You know, every, day, every year we do something, you want to improve on it and continue to make it better. Absolutely. So whereabouts, where, where do you think these... Just uh, pop them gently in the middle there, Ben. I'll put the dates down so that, <laughs> <laughs> so that Trevor can't see them. And, um, how many of these eggs um, are you hoping will eventually hatch? Last year we had 16 eggs. We had three actually hatch. We could possibly incubate them but we want the birds to do it themselves. Ostrich aren't exactly the brightest of animals. And is they, it true about their brain being smaller than their, their eyes? Their brain is actually smaller than their eye. <laughs> um, so what they do is they'll imprint on the first thing they see. Mm -hmm. First thing they see here mm -hmm. is an ostrich. They behave like ostrich. Right. You hand rear them or incubate them. The first thing they see is a person. Mm -hmm. They're going to think they're a person for the rest of their days. We're OK with him just bad. there. Yeah, <laughs> yes. okay. Hopefully. And last them. question, Andy. How do you actually know if they're fertile or not? What we'll do is we'll take them back down to Mark about halfway through the incubation. Mm -hmm. And Mark Ty will actually candle them, which is shining a bright light through the egg. Okay. And he'll be able to see how the egg inside is developing and possibly even a bit of movement. So, excellent. Well, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Well, I think that's a pretty fine nest, even if I say so myself. <laughs> Scrape. I must, Scrape. Get, I must get the word right. Guys, thank you very much for letting me um, help you, and we'll of course keep a close eye on these eggs throughout the series. <laughs> Back up in lion country, Kabir, the new male, has spent his first night at Longleat locked in the trailer while he recovered from the sedative he had for the journey. Exciting day today. We've got our welcome in committee in here, as you can see. This is Luna and Yendi, his new brides. Obviously a stressful few days for all concerned, not just the lions, but for us as well. One of these things that we don't know how any of them are going to react to each other. Oh, this is going to be a nightmare. But the first problem is just to get him in. Lion and Crate together weigh over 250 kilos. Ready? Oh. Oh. I mean, what rest just saying, we're pretty Bang. Language. All right, again. Yeah. One, two, three, lift. Still all away this time. Great group. He's got a good pair of lungs on him, that's for sure. We've heard evidence of that. But he looks all right. You know, he looks in good shape. Um, I should imagine... He... I should imagine he's hungry. Because apparently they didn't feed him for a couple of days because they knew they were going to uh, anaesthetise him. So uh, once he's settled in here, we're going and get some meat. Managing this transfer is going to be difficult. Safety is a big issue. Leon, if you get around the back there, yep. 
stay right out of the way, but tell us whether there's a tail in the doorway or not when we let them through. Mm -hmm. We've done every safety measure that we can think of mm -hmm. so that nothing goes wrong. All right, everyone know what they're doing? Everyone ready? Yep. All right, let's go. You all right, Leon? Yeah. She's gone. Mind, mind your fingers, mind your fingers. Good boy. Just let him get his bearings. Open that one back up, so he's got a choice now of which one he wants to go into. Go on, good boy. That's it. Straight in. No, no, straight in, I said. Thank you. All the way. Go on. <laughs> so I just needed my, my charm to get him in, see. Kabir is a rare Barbary lion, a subspecies characterised by their particularly fine manes. They originally came from North Africa, and these would have been the kind of lions that once ate Christians in the Colosseums of ancient Rome. But in the wild, they were hunted to extinction, so now the Barbary exists only in captivity. All right, mate. Come All right. It's your dindins. Kabir hasn't had any food for two days. If he eats, it'll be a good sign that he's recovering from his journey and has started to settle in. The one thing that we do want to see is him actually eating. We know they've got an appetite. What we don't know is how good his is. You know, he's got a, a fair-sized piece of meat in there. That must be weighing about 40 pounds, I should think. So uh, that would do for starters, I should <laughs> Kabir isn't going to meet the two lionesses face to face quite yet. They'll be kept in adjoining pens for several days before the partition is pulled back. Then we'll find out if this is a match made in heaven or the marriage from hell. Elsewhere in the safari park, there's another new boy who's recently come to Longleat to help with the breeding program. I've come up with head of section Tim Yeo to meet the Eland bull, who's a new arrival since I was last here. Oh, he's rather handsome, Tim. Isn't, Isn't he, Kate? Isn't he great? Isn't he lovely? This is Zambezi, by the way. Very good African name. Yes. Friendly, by the looks of things. He certainly is. He's very much different than some of the girls that we've got next door. He approaches you, he's quite happy to. So far, I mean, he's not shown any aggressive tendencies at the moment, but we're watchful for that. Absolutely. He seems quite small. Is he a juvenile? Yes, he's just coming up to two years of age. Right. Certainly by the time he's sort of seven to eight years of age, he's going to be a, a, a lot larger than this. Very muscular Because they are the biggest antelope in the world, is that right? Yes, they are. These are... Cape Eland, right, and there's a subspecies called the Derby Eland, which yeah. are even larger again. He is looking small, but once he's been out on some good grass, yeah. he'll do a good bit of growing, and uh, it could be a different animal that we're looking at sort of uh, this time next year, really. When do you hope that he might be able to breed with your females? Probably at about a year old, he can do the biz. It's really just his size. He's just he's, too small to reach, is he? He's, he is, exactly. <laughs> he is trying. We've seen him trying with the same uh, female, so the uh, so inclination is there. Exactly. He just, yes. needs to, he just needs to eat a bit more. He does, he does. <laughs> so but, you need uh, to get him out onto the good spring grass and get him do. fed up. And, we and certainly hopefully do. you may have some newborn eland this time next year. Seems incredible to think it's like a dream. It'd be very, yeah, it'd be very exciting. Well, Tim, shall I get out of the way while you let him out? Is that the thing to do? That would be lovely. Okay, back in, the, back in back the vehicle. Back into the vehicle, okay. thank you. Right, Tim, I'm in. Come on, fella. Come on. I suppose this is, okay. this is the tricky thing, isn't it, with a new animal, that they have to kind of learn the park's ways and, and right. how you do things. Yes, very much. He's been going in and out of this gate for some time, and it was a bit tricky when we first started off. Obviously, he's getting on particularly well with one female. There he goes. Brilliant. But they're not bullying him. He's settled in well and... As far as bullying goes, outside they're fine. Yeah. But when we bring them into the confines of the yard and the house, if he was in there with them, he probably would get bullied. So that's why we have him separated now. Thank you very, very much indeed. And, of course, we will keep you updated with Zambezi's progress as the series goes on. Go on, mate, you go and get that grass. You need to grow. Longleat House dates from the time of Elizabeth I. 
But since then, the place has been altered and rebuilt by each successive generation. But over the centuries, the details of all that work have been lost, and there are no complete plans of the house. So now a new survey has been commissioned to measure and map the whole place. It's a massive undertaking, because Longleat is a pretty massive house. Ken Windus is the house steward. He's worked here half his life, and no one knows the secrets of Longleat better than him. It was important to have the survey for several reasons. Not, I mean, one of the things is, of course, is the ability to know where everything is, i.e. where stop valves are for the water, where fuse boxes are for, for the electricity, and indeed where the electricity runs and which, which passageways they take. For hundreds of years, this is all this sort of knowledge has been handed down from word of mouth, from somebody to me, now I've got to hand it on to somebody else. The thing is, if I walked under a bus tomorrow, we got nothing on paper for somebody new to actually pick up the threads, if you can see what I'm saying. Those things would have to be found out afresh. In fact, when it's finished, the new plan won't be on paper, but drawn up on a 3D computer map. But before that can be done, the surveyors need to take hundreds of thousands of measurements. And to do that, they're using laser technology and the most modern equipment. But they do already hold some plans at Longleat. The archivist, Kate Harris, has the ones made by an architect when the house was altered. Trouble is, that was two centuries ago. Here we've got a whole folder of original plans by Sir Geoffrey Wyatt-Bill. Uh, most of them are signed and dated 1800. And they're a whole string of alternatives for changes within the house and for the subsidiary buildings like the stable block. What we haven't got and what he actually built, these went back to his studio in London. We've got a whole set of things where he's actually putting in alternative designs and even amending them. So you've got ones that have got flaps that you can lift and others that have got erasures and changes made after they've been drawn up. In other words, these plans may not show what was actually built. Hopefully, the survey will reveal the whole truth. Well, I've been here 23 years, and I don't think there's many places that I don't know of. However, having said that, no, nothing would surprise me with Longleat. Justin Marshall is one of the surveyors tackling this huge project. He's come down to the gents' loo in the cellars, because this is the only way into one of Longleat's most secret places. Through here, a chamber with an Elizabethan stone window that once looked out across the gardens. Now it's the portal to a subterranean world. It can be very um, spooky. I try not to think about it because you're in the space that hardly anybody's been in over the years. Normally when it's pitch black you can't see around, so you don't know what's around you, and it just happens to be a cobweb, you do freak out a little. This isn't the dungeons, nor has it ever been used for storage. In fact, hardly a soul has been down here in 200 years. It's a series of vaulted chambers underneath the Grand Terrace a feature that was added by the architect Sir Geoffrey Wyattville. So these rooms are actually just part of the foundations. I'm using what's basically a laser tape measure. It's measuring the time taken for the laser to hit the wall and come back again and for my distances. It means that we don't have to have two people measuring in tight spaces. Generally, I would say a room this size would have about 20 readings. The terrace is above us, all the water basically um, flows straight through the walls and drains away through here, so you can just see some of the salt build-ups here, just into uh, many stalactites, is it? Is that right? Is it stalactites or stalagmites? But there are spookier parts to this house. Later on, we'll find out about the body in the basement and the ghost that stalks the corridors.
In Pet's Corner, the meerkats have been going through a lot of changes recently. Meerkat Mountain has been renovated and a pair of mongooses have moved in to share the enclosure as well as the den that's built underneath. Now I'm going to find out how they're getting on. I'm up at Meerkat Mountain to meet keeper Luke Magruder. Hi Luke, how are you uh, doing? Hello Kate. Um, now, the first thing you notice in here is what have you done with all the meerkats? Oh, well, they're all locked inside their house at the minute. Right. Because we're spreading food around and we don't want them to know where we're putting the food. Oh, you're going to hide it, are you? Yeah, we like to hide it around the enclosure so it takes them a few hours to look for it. Plus, we don't want them to associate humans feeding them outside because um. otherwise they'd uh, be tempted to go up to the public and <laughs> beg for food. So what have we got in here? They um, doesn't, doesn't look very appetising. I don't think you'd enjoy it. It's uh, mealworms. Right. Baby beetles. OK, um, and what do you want me to do with them? Well, if you just take um, a, a pinch of uh, mealworms, Kate... Oh, they're very much alive and wiggling, aren't they? Fairly grotesque. Yeah. If you just um, yeah. hide them through, you know, put them on the log and chuck them inside so they have to go looking inside, and I'll put some more in here. Why don't you just put down a bowl of food like you would for your cat or something? Oh, they're basically insectivores. They like to eat insects, basically, and they like to catch them. Yeah. Um, plus, they, we feed them on crickets as well, and they sort of jump about all over the place, and the so is meerkats it, is it really love that. So is it basically good sort of enrichment. stimulus for them? Yeah, 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 it's just basic enrichment for them because... It's just trying to recreate the way that they behave in the wild. They sort of dig around for insects and grubs and... Uh... Oh, yeah. They lose uh, lots of uh, their body weight overnight, so the first thing they do in the morning is go out looking for uh, insects. Now, should I just scatter the rest of this around? Yeah, if we scatter these around... Um... OK. This is an extraordinary thing to be doing, I have to say, yeah. scattering mealworms, but there we go. That's... So... Um... That's all of it done. So can they come out now? Um, uh, not just yet, because uh, Ben and Stewie are over there and they've uh, got oh, some you've more got things. Some stuff. Hi, guys. All right. all right. I'm up with Keeper Stuart Cluley, and we're getting in on the snacking action with these boxes of um, leaves here. Stuart, what, what's all this all about? Well, the same thing as Luke, again, we're just scattering food around, but instead of just food, this is a bit more complicated for them. They've got stuff to look through, dig around, try and find the bugs and okay. stuff. So basically there's, fruit, there's little insects yeah, and things Yeah, it's all these. stuff we got out of the woods over there, leaf litter and stuff, so there's worms and all sorts of things in here. And it keeps them busy, they've got to look for it a bit more. Again, instead of hiding the food in logs, it's all amongst the leaves, it's easy, it's cheaper too. Like Luke <laughs> says, you don't have to store the insects, they're yep. all they're in nature's all garden over there. Absolutely, so should we just sprinkle these around, yeah. is, that, is that right? It's all around here. Excellent, so how, how often do you do this? Um, usually every day, if every other day, mm -hmm. as often as possible really. OK. Do you think um, they're all ready to come out now? I think so. So Dominic's inside cleaning, so... Dominic, you let them out! They should so they're going to come hopefully. out of that tunnel. What's going to come out first, the mongoose or the Probably or the, meerkats? the mongooses, because they're a bit more inquisitive. Oh, it's the meerkats? The meerkats come out first. <laughs> they're not too worried about us being here, are they? Not really. They've got used to me and Luke being in here, of course, public all around all the time. But they're just checking out what's going on before they tuck in. And obviously they get along with the, with the mongoose living together in, in yeah, this area. Yeah, they've been here now for a couple of months living together and doing really well so far. And I've noticed that the meerkats are already eating away. Do you think that's the food that Kate and, and Luke put down? Yeah, they're going for all the mealworms and stuff because it's easy food. It, as the day progresses, they'll start digging more and looking more and then they'll find more. It just helps it last longer. The mongoose just look amazing, don't they? Will they grow a lot larger than that or is that... No, they're that's fully their, grown That's now. their full grown size, is it? They're a lot sleeker than meerkats. They are all loving this food, aren't they? <laughs> Well, Stuart, thank you very much for letting me That's help right. you with that. Any time. I think that we should leave the, um, the mongoose and the meerkats to their yummy food. Up at the Lion House, Kabir, the new male, has spent his second night at Longleat. Bob Trollope is anxious to find out if he's started eating yet. Well, I'm just going to go in there now and check the bed in to see whether the bones are there or whether it's still meat. But it looks pretty good. You know, we, we saw him nibbling at it yesterday. So, this morning, it's going to be the proof of the pudding. We'll just go in there and find, see if we can find the bones. bone fragment, so he's had a good old chew on it. Look at that. There's not an awful lot left, so that's good. That's, that's one good thing that we've... That's what we wanted to see, the fact that he's had something to eat and the fact that he's uh, had quite a bit of it. 
it means he's got his appetite back, which is a good thing. Um, that was just one thing on our list of what we wanted to see him do. The next big step is to mix Kabir with the two lionesses. They've started to get acquainted through the bars of the pen. Luna, which is the one closest to him, seems to be the more up front. And Yendi seems to be a little bit more subdued about the whole matter. But if we can come in here and see her next to him, obviously that would be even better. But, you know, the one thing with them is safety in numbers. They could work as a team. And, uh, they, they could work as a team and, you know, give him a bit of a pasting, which would be good, you know, put him in his place. What we wouldn't want to see is him being too rough for them. The keeper in charge of the Lions, Brian Kent, will have to decide the right moment to slide back the partition. He seems to be settling in quite well, really. You know, he's a bit upset having a strange, being in a strange place. Plenty of noise, that's a good sign. Um, very nice looking metal. Not as big as I imagined, I must admit. So hopefully, we'll be able to mix them in with the two females that are settled at the back there. Hope for the best. <laughs> if you tried to mix them too soon, then I suppose the worst thing would be that they would end up in a death. He's not a big chap compared to some of our other lions, but, you know, he's bigger than them, and he's very powerful. And obviously, you know, even if there's two of them, you could give a lucky blow or a lucky bite or whatever, and that could finish one of them. So, it, you know, it's a careful thing that we've got to do. So, obviously, for everyone's benefit, we don't want to rush it. Obviously, you've got to prepare for the worst. But, I mean, it may just go easy as any. It might just open the doors and they may be fine. Or it could go the other way. Until we do that, we're not going to know. So, will they settle right down as a stable new pride, or will there be skin and hair flying? We'll be back later when the time comes to open the slide. There's more to Longleat than the safari park, the house, and the gardens. It's also a working estate with over 4,000 acres of farmland. <laughs> I'm down at Mill Farm on the Longleat Estate with farmer Steve Crossman and a very new arrival indeed. Steve, how old is this car? It was born yesterday, yesterday afternoon. It's absolutely incredible that it can be up on its feet and, um, and so lively so quickly. Yeah, within 20 minutes to an hour, they're, they're generally up and uh, suckling off their mother. And do, you just, and do you leave her to do everything? Uh, absolutely everything. I just make sure that uh, they're happy and they've made the bond, and once they made the bond, uh, that's my job over, basically. Absolutely incredible. And this one that's sat down just over there, is that a little bit older? Just, yeah, a day or two older, yeah. This one, you know, just nice and quietly. As soon as, as, soon as I'm happy with them, they'll, uh, I'll mark them up and they go out in the field and then the mothers will look after them for the next nine months. They're remarkably hardy animals, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they, they, they're better off out. You know, I keep them in just to make sure the bond's there and then, then we're away and laughing. And I have to ask, I know you're a farmer and kind of sentiments don't necessarily come into it, but do you feel kind of proud and happy at this time of year when all of these this, cars are... This is the on? best, this is what we plan for for the, for the whole of the year and uh, it's fantastic to see them all coming out nice and healthy and, well, as you can see, they're adorable, great, <laughs> great things. Well, Steve, congratulations if I can say <laughs> that. And we still have plenty more stories to come on today's programme, including... Back on Meerkat Mountain, they've got a new boy too. He's got five girls to choose from, and he's in the mood for love. I smell them quite strongly in here, so he's probably keen to get close to them. Lord Bath's new colour-shifting doorway works by remote control, but is a little too high-tech. Once I start fiddling around with it, it <laughs> tends to go wrong. So. <laughs> and Kabir is finally about to meet Luna and Yendi face to face. We expect them to fight, because um, they've got to sort out who's who. Up at the house, there's a survey underway to produce a complete plan. The building is a labyrinth complicated by generations of alterations and rebuilding. Now it's hoped that the survey will, for the first time, reveal all of Longleat's secrets. And who knows what they might discover. After all, in the last century, they found a body. House steward Ken Windus knows where. 
Well, this is the, the basement. I'm taking Dean into the basement now where um, the, it was a skeleton discovered when they were actually building the boiler room. The skeleton was of a member of staff that was supposedly murdered on the orders of the second Viking um, because he supposedly was the lover of his wife, second Viking Tess, Louisa Carteret. This member of staff, the lover, he was supposedly got rid of because he was obviously a threat. Um, and when they dug out the, the, the footings for this boiler room, they actually dug up a body or a skeleton that was actually clothed in the period clothing of the time. So two and two was put together and the story became the fact that this is where he was actually dug up. We've got seven ghosts here, all told. Um, one of the, uh, the obligatory grey lady, that is supposedly Louisa Carteret, who died of a broken heart because her lover was, as far as she was concerned, had left because that was a story that was told to her. I mean, all we can say is that there's 400 years of history here, and what's happened in that 400 years could range from murders to whatever you want to think of. Within the floors and walls of Longleat, there are other secrets. In past centuries, when rooms and staircases were altered and rebuilt, sometimes that meant leaving gaps, voids inside the structure itself. John Beecham is one of the structural surveyors who monitor the condition of the building on a regular basis. It's a job that takes him into the hidden parts. Here we are. Uh, this is um, this is the void in the southwest corner of the house, between several of the period builds, which was 17th and 19th century. The house is full of voids like this. Some of them drop down perhaps 30 feet. A big risk in anywhere like this is fire, because fire could break out in the house and go through the house without you realizing it. So this area here, looking up at the ceiling, has received fire protection boards these are layers of board which separate into manageable areas and try to control the fire. Within the voids are sprinkler systems, so that if it was a fire, hopefully it would be put out by this system. There's been two really serious fires in the last ten years. Up Park, which is a National Trust house, and then of course there's Windsor Castle, which we know about. And fire inside properties like this, once it gets hold, is very, very difficult for the fire brigade to actually uh, cope with, and it's more of a rescue mission rather than anything else. You try to restrict the loss. Um, Longleat is unusual in that it does have the sprinkler system, and this should really help significantly if, heaven forbid, there ever was a problem. The interesting part about these cupboards is that you can see the layers of history and this post and, and the beam here uh, I strongly suspect come from 1580 when the house was originally built. Now the slots here you see in the sides of the beams these are the old tusk tenon joints where the ceiling joists would be offered up and in fact I'm now standing where the ceiling would have been. You can see that more clearly when you look in the cupboard. If you look through in the cupboard in here at the back of the cupboard, there is evidence of the 19th century decoration. There's plaster on the wall and wallpaper, all of which has now been cut off and a new ceiling introduced and a new wall on the left, subdividing the space as fashions moved on, so the areas here have just been left and forgotten. The rooms here, I suspect, are probably little more than 100 years, perhaps, because the decoration on the end wall was... 1806 to 1818, when Wyattville remodelled the house. Uh, I'd imagine this may have been um, part of the family's bedrooms or ensuite uh, facilities in this area. There's actually seven similar to this one around the house, not of the same shape, obviously, but... 
In my day, I've been in most of them, but in my day, I was a lot thinner as well. <laughs> Ken knows the voids, but only where the builders left hatches. There may be more where they didn't. When they've got the new plan as a 3D computer model, they can start looking for discrepancies and mysterious gaps. Then who knows what might be revealed? Kabir, the new lion, is a Barbary male in his prime. Luna and Yendi are both smaller, but they're sisters and they've got him outnumbered. Very soon, Longleat's going to have either a new pride or a disaster on their hands. I've come up to the lion enclosure to catch up with keepers Brian Kent and Bob Trollope and to meet the brand new lion for Longleat, Kabir. So this is pretty exciting news, isn't it, for you guys? It is, really? very exciting. And what's the plan today, then? Um, we think it's time that uh, they... Well, Kabir mixes with his two young ladies. Wow. And they're all in there, are they? They're all in there, yes. So are we OK going in with, with our camera crew and everything? Well, the one thing, we we'll have to be very quiet, and obviously he's not used to all this... Um, all of our heavy, going all on. of our heavy footsteps. So, yeah, <laughs> There's dozens of us. They all come in very steadily. OK. Don't move around too fast. OK. I mean, they've been together in there, you know, separate at the Separated moment. by the wires. But this is the time we want to decide okay. to mix them. I can't wait to, to meet him. Can we, right. can we go yeah. inside? Yeah. Okay, so should we just keep our voices slightly hushed? So how long has he been here for now, Bob? We've had him um, for several weeks now. Uh, can you hear him? Oh, here he is, see? <laughs> He's not sure about He's us. He's not too already, sure about us. Now, obviously, this is the two girls. These are Luna, oh. Luna and Yandy. Right. That's his two young ladies. And here is Kabir. Wow, he's actually surprisingly he's a, he's a lot bigger than I imagined he'd be for some reason. He's um, smaller than Mafui and Charlie, our other males. Gosh, um, but he's he's an impressive animal. He really is, and that that growling is that literally just warning us to he, kind of keep steer away. He's just a little bit uncertain about all of us being here at any one time. You know, it's just normally me or Brian that's in here, so obviously the amount of people. So far, how's he settled in? He's, he's done really well. He's a quiet lion compared to the ones we're used to, because you know, right. they're, they're quite noisy. Um, he's, he's very settled. You know, judging he's only been here a, a little while, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, he's doing fine. Now, obviously, he's been next to, um, next to his, his prospective girlfriends for a <laughs> while girlfriend, now, yeah. separated by that fence. H how have they interacted so far? Well, he's very fond of them, because he does go up to them and lays down beside them. They're very quiet, as you can see, but then they haven't met. So, face to could, face. you know, that could be a total different ball game altogether. And that's what we're doing literally this yeah, afternoon. And this is yeah. what we're going to see. So how will you go about it? What, what sort of precautions do you have to take? Well, what basically we're going to do is we've got a couple of fire extinguishers. Well, how does a fire extinguisher work <laughs> <laughs> against a lion? It's more to use as a noise, because if they do kick off and it gets a bit yeah. bad, yeah. And what we do is just spray these, the CO2 it is, right. makes a hell of a racket, yeah. enough to confuse them, hopefully, so we can split them back up again. So the, the, the kind of worst-case scenario is that there will be a sort of fight between them, a cat Possible. fight? Yeah. Possible, we, yeah. We expect them to fight, because they've, they've got to sort out who's who. Right. You know, he's a new lion, they've never met him face-to-face, -face, so they've got to lay down the ground rules. Right. You know, he's got to be a dominant animal, and to all sense and purposes, they've got to be submissive. OK. Well, guys, I can't wait to, um, to follow this. Are we allowed to watch? Yeah, might need you to hold a bar at the <laughs> Might need some help. Blimey, I can't, can't wait. Can't do it on our own. <laughs> <laughs> well, join us later in the programme when we see what happens when they're mixed together. <laughs> Something very similar is about to happen down in Pet's Corner, though it probably won't be so noisy. At the moment, the meerkats and their new friends, the mongooses, are a happy-go-lucky gang. But there's strife, jealousy and heartache on the way, because the five meerkats are all girls. And now a single man has just arrived on the scene. So far, though, keepers Luke McGruver and Stuart Cluley have kept him separate, locked up in the den for his own safety. With meerkats, what you can't do is put them straight in together because all they'll do is fight. During the day, we let the girls out and let him have the free roam so they get to know his smell. By this point, a week later, they should be completely comfortable with each other's smell, but they'll, they might fight a little bit when they come out. 
The new boy has been named Basil and he's itching to meet the girls. He knows they're here, he saw them last night briefly, he can hear them, he can smell them quite strongly in here. So he's probably keen to see them, see how many they are and get close to them, but we don't want to rush into it. In the wild, meerkats live in a social group called a mob, and in each mob there's an alpha male and an alpha female who are usually the only ones that mate and have babies. So Basil will have to make a choice, and for the girls, there's everything to play for. The most vicious fighting in meerkats that we've had is between females, actually. A young female against an older female, they tend to fight, and when they fight, it's actually very, very vicious. <laughs> But the girls have waited long enough, and Basil is in the mood for love. All we need now is the right music. You know what I feel like doing to you right now? Holding you and maybe pleasing you. <laughs> maybe you know what? I feel love coming on. As soon as the girls came into the boys' pen, you see them rubbing up against each other. That's like just swapping scents, really. They smell individually, but the whole group's scent is a combination of all their different smells, so looks good so far. Let the music play. I just wanna dance the night away. Basil doesn't seem to have picked his girl yet. It looks like he's still playing the field, and there have been no tears so far. Just accepted him. It seems to be going very well. No fighting at all, really, which is a big relief because when they first he first came here, there was a lot of anxiousness trying to get through the bars at him and stuff. The females are very young. We think they're only a year old, so they're a nice young group of females. He's only two or three years old, so they should bond together quite nicely, and hopefully in a couple of months we might have some baby meerkats about. But first things first, for now, Basil and the girls are happy just to fool around. We'll be keeping you posted of all developments from the Tunnel of Love. Alexander Thin, the seventh Marquis of Bath, is a colourful character. He still lives in Longleat House, though obviously he doesn't occupy the state rooms. That would be rather inconvenient when all the visitors are here. So Lord Bath resides upstairs in a penthouse suite that he's had designed and decorated to his own very individual taste. I've come up to Lord Bath's private apartments right at the top of the house and I'm here with the designer, Roy Wilcock. And you designed basically everything in this apartment, didn't well, you? Well, most of it, yes. Yeah. The majority of it. Yeah. Um, now, there's a new special thing, Lord Bath. Hi. Hello, <laughs> lovely to see you. Hello. You're standing right in front of it. This is magnificent. Just the first thing that's going to be put here, but yeah. the bookshelves, all that area too, I'm hoping to, to have done in the same sort of way, so that it, uh, instead of a sort of boring little bit to walk through, it, it has its great attraction. What was the brief that you gave Roy and his team? That I want to make use of the old library through that door, okay. and can one have it so that I can see through. Roy, it's beautiful, very, very unusual. So when you got this brief of making a sort of door that wasn't a door right. and something that would be unusual for the apartment, how did you go about coming up with this design? Well, in fairness, the design really was the creation of Claire Rendell. Mm -hmm. She's a very artistic lady who works as a team with us. Yeah. Lord Bath gave us the hint that he wanted a forest scene. And so she brought out all the foliage and the leaves and the little animals and the mushrooms. And it works extremely well, and it's, uh, she's made a brilliant job of it. Yeah. We're very, very pleased. And the woodwork ties in quite well, as we'll see in a moment, with the, with the rest of the apartment, but also does almost feel like trees itself. Yeah, well, that was the idea, really. It, it would have looked hideous had it been modern framework, yeah. so it had to be 
um, sympathetic to the actual concept. What I love about it, Lord Bath, is the fact that it just changes all the time. It's, it's, <laughs> it's brilliant. Is, is it light set into it, or well, how does it work? Well, um, I think Claire c came up with the possibility of doing this, with the lights changing. Yeah. I can flick a button so that it sticks on one of the lights. And oh, so you can control it? Yes, but once I start fiddling around with it, it <laughs> tends to go wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Where, are the mind it, so. <laughs> Where are the controls? Is it like a television remote control? or? Um, well, let's have a look over here. Here, there's... Are they? Oh, are they all built into the desk? Uh, from the command seat over oh, here. Well, of course. <laughs> it's, I, I do love this room, Roy. Was it one room when you took it on and you kind of modernised it? No, or... it wasn't. No, it was several <coughs> rooms, actually. Um, these it alcoves was... were actually other rooms. Mm -hmm. right. It was the area where my father collected his... Um, Hitleriana and Churchilliana, and I oh, had to right. find a way of getting them out of the house. <laughs> Thatcher as well, one example. Oh, yeah, and Mrs. Yes. Thatcheriana yes, as well. She was here as well. I think my father regarded us as the people who had um, changed this century, and right. so therefore he, he had a sort of collection with regard to all of them. Did you decide you wanted kind of not just a new era for you, but a new era for the house and everything as well? I wanted to, to leave the area that I've lived in all my life down there, where I've done the murals. I, to yeah. leave it like that, yeah. and so that um, my family can be down there, and if I want to escape, I can. You can come up here. <laughs> yes. can, it, can we see these controls uh, work? Yes. These are the controls here. Oh, uh, it is just like a One can press telly. buttons there. Yeah. The trouble is, if I start pressing them, I'll never get it <laughs> back to what it was. <laughs> but can you, because can you, the door does open behind ah, it, is I that right? I make the door open, oh, yes. Yeah. That can makes... we see that happening? Right. It's like Aladdin's Look cave. Look at this. Yes. So wow! Yeah. Fantastic. Lord Bath, <laughs> if you ever have a spare one, can I have it? <laughs> Thank you very, very much indeed. And Roy, congratulations. Thank it's a great much. addition to the room. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm back up at the Lion House with Longleat's newest lion, Kabir, and keepers Brian Kent and Bob Trollope. And it's very exciting because he is about to be mixed with the, these two young girls, Luna, and Yendi, is that right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. For the very first time, and no one knows quite what's going to happen. Guys, are you as nervous as I am? Very, very <laughs> nervous, yeah. <laughs> well, we have all the precautions in place. So what's going to happen? We're literally going to pull the partition away Just from... Just going to basically pull the door open, mm -hmm. stand back. Happens. He's making a few gentle rumblings. These guys look like they're asleep. <laughs> they are at the moment, yeah. <laughs> they are. They'll soon wake up. Will they? OK. Yeah. If you could be ready with a fire extinguisher, just to make a bit of noise if okay. things go wrong, if we say something. And the worst case scenario is that they'll start fighting, but hopefully we'll... Yeah. we'll it is possible that will be happening, yeah. OK. Right, please be good, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> should, we, um, should we let you, should we let you we um, open, the, open the case? Right. All right. Wow. Oh, she, was... Blimey, she was so quick going in there. Very quick. <laughs> is, that, is that the sort of reaction that you imagine, Brian, that straight away she'd go and sit down next to him like that? To be honest, you didn't know what to expect. You know, yeah. they could have just stayed apart. Who is that in there, in fact? That's Luna. Luna. That's Luna. Yeah. They seem totally un... Um, perturbed by each other. Quite being Maybe surprised. because they've been next to each other in the pens, they've accepted each other, and this is... Is this, 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 this is, like, so this far, is yeah. great news, isn't it? But we still have one hiding at the end. Uh, yeah. Mainly the door scared her to go in over that way. But, right. I mean, obviously there's nothing happening between them, so it's a good sign. And, and a brilliant sign, because yeah. you're hoping that this is going to start a brand new sort of breeding programme here, is that right? Well, hopefully, you know, the fact that he's a Barbary lion is, is very rare. Mm -hmm. um, there's only How about, rare? There's only about 70 in, in the world. Really? Um, Kabir here <laughs> has sired 10% of them. Gosh, so, oh, so you, yeah. there's, hopefully there shouldn't be any trouble with him. Um, he, he's a proven mare, so right. you know, hopefully that we can uh, extend that range. And, and the two girls that you chose, Luna and Yendi, did you choose them because they were specifically young? or They're specifically young, and plus the fact that um, with the pride that they were, Mafui's pride, you wouldn't want to breed from them because they're too closely related to right. father. So we started a new pride as such. Potentially how long before they could start breeding? Hopefully he will stimulate... Um, these females in the coming to season, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a full season to start with, but then after a, a week or so, it should come into season properly, and then hopefully, three and a half months later, we should have cubs. Well, I don't know about you, but they look like quite a happy couple already <laughs> to, <laughs> <laughs> to be introduced for the very first yeah. time. <laughs> look at them. Well, best of luck, guys. Well, oh. congratulations that, that it was such a, a happy um, kind of union.
so of far. <laughs> early days, <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, we'll keep you updated about their progress throughout the series. To produce the first ever complete plan of Longleat House, thousands of measurements still need to be taken. After all, there are over a hundred official rooms and more than a mile of corridors. Just to survey the roof is going to take a couple of days, even with their modern laser equipment. Meanwhile, down below, Ken Windus has brought structural surveyor John Beecham to another of the voids, hidden parts of the house created by rebuilding work two centuries ago. Right, this is the part of the house where you see the inside face of the old Elizabethan windows dating from 1580. Um, this floor obviously been inserted, leaving the symmetry on the outside. Looking around, you've got the floor of the room above you and a spread of truss here, which was inserted. And over here, there's this fantastic record of the history of when the work was done by J. Colston, plasterer, 1807, so that puts it right in the middle of the Wyattville um, work on the house. And Smith D. from London, 1807 again. It's always very interesting to visit houses like this. There's always something new, something different to see. It's a very refreshing um, and interesting exercise. It uh, makes it all worthwhile. Back on the roof, Dave Hewins has come to see how it's going. He's the clerk of works at Longleat and he's looking forward to when the survey plan is finally complete. For us this is very important because it will enable us to get an accurate record of exactly how the house is at the moment. The house has been altered and added to for much of, the, sort of its history. We've got voids that we know are in there but we don't know exactly where they run and how big they are. Uh, we've got service routes we can't trace, so this will enable us to get accurate plans to make sure that we can get all the maintenance done efficiently and safely. I'm absolutely certain there are voids in the house that we don't know about, bits that have been blocked up over the years, uh, doorways will have been blocked off, bits of room will have been lost just to improve the layout for the people living in the house at, at any given time. Hopefully, if we're lucky, we might find the family silver as well. And that's not a far-fetched idea, because above Wyattville's grand staircase is a void that contains a real treasure, precious to house steward Ken Windus. All right, this is the actual workings of the clock here. It's a clock overtaken by time itself. And you're just in time to hear the bell ring. The mechanism dates from about 1700. This small clock face at the back is just a modern addition to help set the time. The real clock face used to be outside, mounted on the wall of a turret overlooking a courtyard. But that turret was later engulfed inside a much grander tower. So, for two centuries, that once proud face has stared blankly into the blackness of a void. And it's a very awkward place to get at. Well, I've rigged up a little gadget here that might help. It's not very classy, but it might work. It's a mirror on the end of a broom, as you can see. There we go. Can you see it there? It's a Roman numerals painted in what looks like cream, cream paint, I would think. Might have been gold at one time. It is exciting for the simple reason that it's probably the first time it's been seen by people like myself for about 200 years. Because it was the uh, early 1800s it was actually covered in. It's one of the good parts about working here is the fact that, um, you know, I'm an old 23 years now and I'm still discovering things. You know, it's a sort of a place that has got 400 years of history. So you, you can expect, if you like, to find new things every time you pull a floorboard up or, or renew a, a slate or, or whatever you're doing. 
It will be some months yet before the new plans are completed and fully evaluated. Will Longleat have any more secrets to reveal? Only time will tell. We're down in Pet's Corner to meet Head of Section Darren Beasley with a rather special delivery for a rather important tortoise. Hi, yeah, um, hi, hi, hi. Now, we've got a beautiful, healthy plateful here. Is this basically tortoise heaven, what we've got on this uh, plate? If, if I put Sid down for this now, this is Sid tortoise, by the way. Right. He will absolutely adore everything on there, but I'm afraid there's a lot of stuff that's not particularly good for him on there. So this is a special treat because he's only just woken up. Right. We want to get his appetite going, stimulate his appetite. So things like the banana and the tomatoes, they'll eat. Yeah. They're not particularly good tortoise foods. That'll put, the banana will put weight on him, but right. if he eats right. it all the time, it'll make him poorly. It's got to be dandelions, thistles, you know, all the wild, wild high calcium f uh, food. And when you say that Sid's just woken up, I assume you don't just mean from a night's sleep. No, he's been in for about 16 weeks now, nearly four months, or just wow. about four months, so long time. And, and no eating during that time? No eating, and shouldn't be any moving. A lot of people think when they're in, in their boxes, you know, they, they shuffle around. That shouldn't really happen. If you hold them at about five degrees, there should yeah. be no movement, because the system just completely shuts down. You know, they're, they're really just on tick over, so no going to the toilet, no eating. Certainly no moving. He's the first male to wake up, which is uh, quite nice. So he's the first boy up this year. Yeah. Um, and what you have to do is you, you basically give him a little MOT. Oh, he goes to the toilet. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> get, oh, well, get, at least we know the waterworks yeah, water are working. Right, yes. you, you've got to flush him through, get rid of all of that, that horrible stuff. Um, make sure his eyes and mouth are clean and, and get his appetite back. That's the crucial thing. So uh, that's what we've done. We keep his body temperature up, give him lots of nice things to eat that he'll enjoy. Okay, he must well, be ravenous. I think, I think he probably is. <laughs> Sid, we'll feed you now. That's all we've got time for. On today's programme, but here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Rosie the otter needs an x-ray to see if she's got a life-threatening illness. And I dread them finding something big in the x-rays. Spot the zebra must have emergency dental treatment to save him from starving to death. <laughs> and will the bongos be safe when they're released into the big wide world? You know, anything can happen out here. We'll have all that and more on the next Animal Park. <laughs>